Hello and welcome to today's discussion about Michaela Cole's new drama, I May Destroy You. I'm Jackie Lockinger. I'm going to be your moderator today. So if you haven't seen the show, just a little brief explain on what it is. Um, I May Destroy You is maybe some would say a show about consent, but I think it's a little bit more complex and nuanced than that. But it follows a beloved millennial writer played by Michaela Cole named Bella, who's dealing with life after sexual assault in a nightclub. So before we start a discussion, um, I would like if our beautiful panelists could introduce themselves. So first up is Hiram. Hisham, sorry about that. Hello. Um, so um, my name is Hisham, I'm a third year philosophy student at SAS um, and the current anti-racism officer. Um, and so on campus, I'm involved in a lot of um, campaigns addressing racial equality um, and have also um, received training and facilitated workshops um, for the Enough is Enough um, campaign. Um, my interests are in predominantly in, in anti-racist activism um, and creating creative spaces for um, underrepresented groups in higher education. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just a bit about me, I guess. Thank you. Um, and now I believe we have Stephanie. Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student at Goldsmith. I did my MA in Gender and Sexuality Studies at SOAS. Um, I participated and critiqued the <laughs> Enough is Enough Consent Workshop <laughs> curriculum. Um, and my research is centered around um, housing insecurity experienced by African descended men, um, specifically looking at housing transients. Um, but in general, I'm, I'm interested in gender, race, and class, and I found this topic to be something relevant to my research, and I'm looking forward to discussing it. Thank you. And Rush? Hello, my name is Rush Frazier. Uh, they, them, theirs pronouns. I am uh, coming to you from Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, I am the president of Worcester County Pride, as well as a field organizer with uh, Neighbor to Neighbor. Um, I've been organizing for about 15 years uh, across a multitude of issues. Thank you. We also have uh, another panelist joining us later on a date as they are in a different panel, very popular. Um, so very briefly, before we go into discussion, I just wanna let the audience know, we'll be looking at three themes central to the show, friendship, sexuality, and trauma. But first, can I hear everyone's initial opinions on I May Destroy You? Hisha? Oh gosh, okay, cool, going first. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, I, I kind of, I, I rewatched it last week. Um, uh, to kind of um, pick my brain a bit more. Um, and I think I found the second time I watched it even more kind of um, dizzying than the first time. Um, and so I think, I don't know, this question is quite difficult, but um, a few of the things that I can probably um, pick out um, and that I found um, really incredible um, about the show was the kind of um, Cole's, uh capacity to put herself to place herself into the frame which i feel like is incredibly difficult to do um particularly because she's fictionalizing her own experiences um and so i think that's m kind of the highlight for the show for me um uh kind of putting yourself in that position to kind of absorb and to um confront um trauma that you're carrying around and to do that in this way you know um for it to be um on television and for it to receive the acclaim that it has um i think that um yeah that's kind of incredible so i think that's probably one of um the uh uh biggest things that stood out for me thank you 
Rush. Thanks. You know, I um, I am <laughs> coming to this uh, this panel a little bit underprepared uh, in last minute, but um, you know, I thought it was such an important show uh, focusing on a single black woman, um, such a unique like uh, perspective. You know, like a lot of the media I consume out here. You know, if we uh, are lucky enough to see a black woman featured on television. It's usually um, an African American woman, um, and so often she's portrayed as the you know the comic relief. And and while I may destroy you was pretty funny, um, it was definitely incredibly real. I could identify with so many of the characters. Um, I just kind of uh, had the same feeling about the series the way that one would. Uh, you know, kind of cherish a good book um, in that, you know, I had to put it down so many times and uh, press the pause button and kind of take a little bit of walk around my apartment um, just to really like think over the themes and like how, how many intersections to the lives of my friends and uh, in my own life. Um, I'll stop there before I uh, continue gushing. Thank you for that, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you for that, both of you. Um, so we were on lockdown when we were trying to watch this show. So just as Rush said, like I think that made it all the more heavy, like you couldn't even run from it. Um, so that that definitely influenced how I thought about it. Um, sitting with it and you know procrastinating on my schoolwork, I compared it to three things. Um, and don't judge me for this. <laughs> I compared it to Law and Order SVU, Fleabag, and this is the part I really don't want you to judge me for, 12 Years of Slave. I'll explain why, don't judge me, don't judge me, I'll get to the point. <laughs> but obviously it's very much like um, Law and Order SVU in that, you know, this sexual violence occurred, the police are investigating it, but rather than focusing from the perspective of the investigators, it focused on the person who experienced the violence. Um, so I think in that way, it's very clear, but what it did really well, in my opinion, was that it didn't give you the satisfaction of, give, of like solving this crime, which I think is really important when we're centering the stories of Black women because so few Black women who experience, which is a lot of us, experience sexual violence get to have that sort of gratification. And so not having it in that, you know, you know, wrap a bow around it, storytelling type of way was really important. Um, so in that way, I was comparing it to SVU. Um, Fleabag, I think it was really like Fleabag. I think they're sort of mirror images of one another. I mean, they're both like millennial women in London, living life, being sexual, doing stupid things. They're both kind of like not exactly lovable characters, you know what I mean? Like you were like, mm, but why would you do that? <laughs> and in that way, like the complexity of that character made it so much more realistic. Like you can see yourself in that position. We've all been there, night drinking, stuff happens you could see you could put yourself in her shoes and like it is all the more scary so in that way like i compared it to fleabag just seeing how different uh the reception of this show has been compared to the accolades and discussions around fleabag and and how how far people have shown away from from discussions about this show in particular compared to the reception of fleabag okay so 12 years of slave like i said don't judge me okay 12 Years a Slave, I don't watch that show or that show, that movie for the meta narrative. I watch it for Patsy because that story was like the first time that I heard and felt the story of an enslaved woman who was experiencing all kinds of trauma and hurt and depression in this structure and system. And never seen it in, portrayed in that way before. I think that's what that film did really well. Like I wasn't particularly invested in Solomon North of story, and I think that's part of why it is that um, Lupita Nyong'o won the award and and not him, right? So I compared this show to Twelve Years a Slave in that for me, as much as like I was invested in the story of um, Arabella, I was really, really shocked at the story of Kwame. 
So I'll pause there and get back to it. Thank you. Um, I love I love the way you broke it down. Um, I would say what stood out to me is the fundamental Britishness of the show, just similarly to what you said, Raj. I think it's so very rare that for me in this decade, definitely, there is a show, British show about black British people living in London that isn't to do with racism they're facing that is like hugely, you know, like riots or anything like that. Obviously, like the theme of riots and, you know, conflict is kind of in the back. You know, it's playing on the TV, it's on her phone. You always see these snippets of the real life of what it means to be black, but it, it was so refreshing for me to actually see a young black person just walking around London, living their life, getting drunk with their friends, which is something I haven't seen often. Um, and it was even more interesting speaking to an American colleague of mine who hilariously said to me, it's just so crazy. They play grime music everywhere. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, they do. And it's like little things like that that I take for granted, like the music that we listen to in the UK is so distinctly from the UK that it's actually like foreign to other people. So those little moments that I would have missed if I hadn't had a conversation with someone else about, I really appreciated that Michaela inserted them into the show. Even like language bits, like when they said, when, when she says raw, like raw, my colleague asked me what that meant. And I was like, it's just, it's just the British way of saying, wow, or what, or I can't believe this. So it's like these little things I, I really appreciated and loved. So let's get into the themes. So the theme of friendship, um, I think what's really interesting to me, and I wanna ask you if you think this is interesting as well, is how I feel a lot of the comedy is so centered around the friendships. Like when we do get the big laughs and the kind of cringe moments, it is when Arabella is with her friends, as almost if her friends represent the joy that she has in her life and the place where she can have joy, she feels accepted. So I guess the question is, how do you feel about the representation of friendship? Did you, do you like it, didn't like it? Let me know your thoughts. Stephanie, do you want to start? Um, yeah, but I'm not gonna start with Arabella. I'm gonna start with Kwame because he's really like the center of the show for me in a lot of ways. Um, because of my interest in masculinity. Um, for me, Kwame's story was a search for friendship because I found it uh, challenging for him and for me that he, I, he, his best friends, these two black women were cis het black women, do you know what I mean? And so it was complex for him to be queer identifying and love these two people, but be in search of love and a different type of friendship um, throughout the entire show that he was sort of filling in with sexuality. Um, and so his relationships and the way that they evolved over time, I thought was brilliantly executed because you could, over time, you got to learn more about what it is that he was filling with the sexuality. Um, I, I identify a lot of different parts of the challenges he was going through. Like, um, I mean, we'll talk more about his the sexuality during that portion of the talk. But for me, I found it really interesting that um, when he when he goes to the birthday party <laughs> and it was a black birthday party, you guys, and they were playing black ass music and people were climbing through windows and the food was serious. like. We've all been to a real party, and if the food ain't serious, it's a problem. And so I was like, this, this I recognize. And when I saw who was present in that space and how very real and millennial that space was to <laughs> having roommates and having like being broke, but everybody contributing, um, I, I was looking at friendships in that way. And I was just looking at who was present in that space 
not just because of their blackness, but because of how queer too, the outfits that people were wearing and how they were representing their queer, their queer identities and their sexuality <laughs> very visibly, because obviously it's a show and we have to pick up on these cues. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there, but for me, I was looking at the challenges that Kwame was having within that friendship, but how deep and true the, those relationships were. Um, and lastly, I'll compare it to <laughs> the, the, the moment when he's attempting to pass um, and how it really becomes a friendship with that white woman. He goes on a date um, and he, he, it didn't feel inauthentic. He was being himself, but he knew that it wasn't him because he hadn't told her. And when he does finally, I mean, we can talk about that part later, but when he does finally, <laughs> you know, shows himself his like true self and he sort of exhales and he's like, this is me. They could accept each other as deep friends too, not in the same way. Like it kind of felt like family when, it, when he was with um, the two black women, but just to center like his experience in that, like for me, friendships specifically masculinity and femininity as being like central in friendships was a, a key theme in the friendships discussion so i'll pause there and give the mic back what i loved about the friendship uh aspects of the show is like more like a family in that you know sometimes family like they've known each other since uh what the equivalent of middle school or high school um so you know, like friends that have been together that long, there's like pain there. You don't always do each other right. You don't always do right by each other. There's like, a, it gets complicated and messy. And uh, I really liked the way the show kind of navigated those messes and didn't just like idealize the whole thing. Um, you know, sometimes like you're, I mean, for example, when Arabella locks Kwame in the, in the room, you know, uh, yes, she's really fucked up, but can I swear? I can swear, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so yes, but that's still like no excuse for, for what she did. And just like how, um, like the growth that happens uh, during the course of the show uh, really stuck with me. Um, I think, yeah, you, I think, yeah, I was basically gonna um, speak to that as well. And I definitely agree um, in um, that, uh, she doesn't seem to shy away from the messes. And I feel like each of the characters, um, each of the friends are implicated as well in each other's traumas. Um, and you get that moment where um, after they come back um, from the station and she said, well, can we promise not to leave each other again? And then she says, oh, but you know, um, like I didn't leave you basically. And she, she's already fallen asleep. And um, there are a few moments in there um, uh, where we are told that, you know, oh, actually on the night um, that it happened, um, for example, they, um, he um, called Terry to ask if it was okay to leave her, um, and which we didn't previously know. So uh, everyone's kind of implicated in each other's traumas, um, but that also, which is just the reality of, you know, a lot of situations, but that doesn't take away from, for example, the care she's able to give um, and how relentless she is in that, um, in the care that she gives um, over the course of the series. So there's kind of a really um, complex um, uh, asymmetry, I guess, that runs throughout in the fact that there's no resolution, but also in the fact that, you know, um, each character has um, a moment or a few moments where um, they slip up and whether, you know, the plus other person knows or not, they continue to navigate that themselves and within the, you know, the, the context of um, the friendships. Um, so I thought um, that was um, really well done and um, dealt with as well. Yeah, thank you. I think the show kind of asks us like, who are our friends and what can we expect of our friends? And like, when we experience something difficult, how, how do we come together as friends in a way that's, as you said, appropriate for all of us? Because I think, yeah, the, the show kind of complicates that kind of what seems black and white is actually a lot more complicated. Um, so let's go to the second theme unless you guys have any more points that you guys want to talk about no 
So the next theme is depictions of sexuality. Um, how do you guys think the show discussed and depicted sexuality and particularly having Michaela Cole kind of center herself, obviously, as a cis head woman, but opening up conversations about transphobia and dating as well as, you know, Grinder and people's expectations of what Grinder is and what it means, threesomes and, you know, generally like kind of stealthing. Um, what are your kind of feelings of how the show dealt with it or looked at it or approached it? Um, and this time, Hisham, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, so um, gosh, there's, um, I think this is the one um, theme that I had um, the most trouble with kind of sorting my thoughts into any kind of coherent um, uh, uh, thing. But I think, um, uh, there. I'm actually going to throw this on and bounce off just because I have so much to say and um, I think yeah that will help me come up with um, with something a lot more interesting. Stephanie would you like to start? <laughs> okay yeah um, so as I said, my, my academic research is on um, housing transients among, among housing transients and housing instability among um, African descended men. So I was really interested in this show because, because of the housing issue, right? So there's a part where there he meets, where Kwame meets the a person that he's genuinely interested in and they have a mutual connection. The other person is like in the closet or somewhat closeted and they're trying to find a place to be together and they didn't have that. And it sort of set the stage for more violence to take place. But I was really interested in that story because that's a story that I've never seen before I've never heard before not on tv right like it's something that as, an, as a scholar that I'm interested in right like how people use their sexualities and where where does like sex sex and sexual acts take place um and the concept of home and the sexual acts that take place in homes um but I've never seen it depicted on in popular media. So I was really struck by that. And there just, there was, there was from, there was a perspective. So someone was standing someplace where this was extremely visible and decided that this was a story that needed to be told. And if it wasn't for queer, black, low income people <laughs> in a room someplace with the opportunity to tell that story, that story would have never been told. It wouldn't have been visible and it wouldn't have brought to light the discussions that take place around um, the sexual violence that Kwame experiences as a queer black man. Um, I also want to point out that when Kwame experiences something that he's challenged to identify, um, he doesn't have the vocabulary to call it what he thinks he may have experienced. He goes to the police and he's like, this is what happened. This is what happened. I can tell you that this, this is, I know the address. This, this is where I was. Like, I know where I was. And the guys, like the police officer who's there, who was treating him sort of <laughs> juxtaposing the two experiences of Kwame and, um, and Arabella, um, the, the man, a black man who's standing in the presence of another black man, um, <laughs> when he starts talking about what happened to his physical body and he's naming body parts, the police officer is repelled by this idea that this person could be in the same body as him and use his sexuality so differently from him. And he like runs out of the room just with that fear that this is something that he doesn't know and can't explain. Um, and so he becomes sort of a gatekeeper of, of like the law and order and preventing, um, preventing Kwame from having justice in that space. I'll, I'll stop there. Oh, can I go? I'm gonna go. Um, so I really appreciated how sloppy it all was. Like everything was just a mess. Everybody was so messy. Um, yeah, definitely. 
absolutely. Uh, I love everything that you just brought up, Stephanie. I, I just feel like so much of what I saw around sexuality was that there was no, like, it just drove home for me, like, just how much there's no, like, right way to heal. You know, Arabella goes through this very traumatic uh, rape, you know, and uh, she's like, you know, a couple episodes down the line, she's like getting back in bed with somebody, you know? Um, and it's not like, it's not clean or neat or tidy. There's no long block of exposition. She just kind of, you know, attempts to bang the guy, you know? And um, I I wanted to like strangle that guy so much, um, her, her coach or uh, assistant. I really liked, um, I kind of liked that everybody was allowed to be some sort of snob, um, you know, like some level of like middle finger to like respectability politics or like the right way to be a victim. Um, even though uh, both Arabella and Kwame go to the police station to seek justice, um, you know, they're not falling into this like easy trap of like trauma porn. I didn't think it went there. I think it was a lot more rich um, and I think that, you know, like trauma porn is what happens when like white folks tell our stories or when like cis men, het men tell our stories. Um, she's at the same time, you know, while she's like sloppy in certain points of her life, she's also a published author, you know, um, she's got it going on. Like nobody in that, uh, for all their mistakes, you know, it's not like, um, it's not like that is all that there is to them. Thank you. Um, I, oh, sorry. No, no, I was about to say, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Noan. I think um, just like ordering um, my thoughts more as well. And um, the scene um, where um, Kwame goes to the um, police station um, and he gives his, um, you know, he gives his um, testimony as well. And I, I found that scene incredibly uncomfortable um, for a number of reasons. And you, I kind of sat there making the comparison between um, the, uh, uh, what happened um, when Arabella goes into the um, station and reports and what happens when, um, you know, he um, goes into the station and the, the um, police officers kind of like, well, you know, there are self-reporting stations and, you know, you don't have to go through, you know, and to tell me all of, you know, um, the, the kind of um, intimate details of, um, you know, gay sex, for example. Um, and um, there's a lot going on within that. And I feel like for most of the series, um, uh, Michaela Cole kind of tiptoes on this tightrope, um, really. And she kind of rejects that part sensationalist, part cautionary tale narrative that often gets pushed in the media when it comes to um, stories and um, you know incidents of um, rape and sexual assault. Um, but I feel like that was the one time where maybe she falls into that trap and it did feel kind of part cautionary tale, i.e., you know, this is what could happen um, if you, as for example, like a gay man or a gay black man um, or queer um, uh, person goes into the um, police station and tries to report that. I felt like it was important um, for that to be shown on television. Um, which kind of leads on to the second point, which is that um, she kind of, it's this like really rich um, kind of uh, web of like possibilities, both descriptive and prescriptive, right? You've got, um, um, so for example, in the scene after she's um, uh, experienced um, the stealth thing where he removes um, the condom during sex without her consent. And at the time that he makes that known, she doesn't actually know what, stealthing is um, and the significance of it. And they immediately go to, she says, well, you know, I need to get, you know, the morning after pill, like you need to pay for this. And they have that experience, which is um, not kind of marked by any kind of traumatic realization. Um, and then you've got after she realizes what had gone on and there's a name for that. Um, and, you know, um, and she finds that out and then she goes on stage and she, there's that different response. So I think like the, the possibilities there, the, um, they include both scenarios, I guess, um, where, you know, um, 
uh, I feel like for the viewer, particularly for um, the younger viewer, or any viewer who doesn't or hasn't really seen these kind of um, narratives playing out on the screen, it's very useful that she's kind of had actually, you know, that's what you do. But then also once she's come to the realization, we, you know, we realize that, you know, this is actually um, illegal and something terrible has happened. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking about as well. Thank you. I would love for us to talk a little bit more about maybe Terry and Terry's threesome. And um, Hisham, I really liked the way you explained this thing about it's not traumatizing, but then it is because you can name it and you can place it. And it's like the feeling behind your back where you're like, something isn't right, but I don't know what it is or where to look to find out if this is right. So. Terry kind of has a similar realization where she, throughout the series hints on her being a bit more sexually open than the others might say she is. And she kind of wears this threesome, like this crazy thing that she's done, this, ex this thing that is exciting about her almost. And then she obviously has this conversation and then she realizes that those men actually kind of plan to get with her. How do you feel like that kind of played out? And, and as you as an audience member, how did that make you feel positive, negative? Um, I would love to hear you guys thought. Let's start with Stephanie. Um, okay. So first I think it's important to identify that because this story doesn't come from a white gaze that it was really important to situate yourself in Terry's experience in that moment. She's on vacation and she'd been drinking. She took pills. She was she was lit. And she wasn't having a good time with her friends. And she was kind of pissed about that. But then she's walking home thinking that's the end of her night. And someone tries to hit on her. And she gets free drinks. Like, I put myself in her shoes. And I was like, I would have gone with the flow in that situation too. Like, I would have gone with the flow. And it would have been a great story to tell for me, like if I had been in that situation, but I took a step back and I thought about the fact that we don't really get to hear so much about black women's um, sexual agency. It usually, it's too often the story of victimhood and violence and trauma. And so I really was struggling with this story because I, I think hindsight can be challenging in that way. <laughs> that, like knowing that information after the fact, after you thought you did something wild, but it was on your terms. And then someone like knowing more information about it took that agency away from you. And you, just, and you can sort of feel Terry grappling with that challenge throughout the story. A lot of what happens in the rest of the story hinges on Terry's experience that night. like she left Arabella in that state. And so she was holding guilt about that. Like what kind of friend could she be? And then she thought she had a great time. And then she found out that it was sort of like a con. It was, it was not on her terms. It was like the situation changed when she had more information. And then to be consulted <laughs> when, when Arabella was in the same state and then to find out that what happened to her, she was holding so much guilt from all of that. I think the two things um, are, are really important to carry. They carry the story because if you don't understand Terry's role in that, in that story, in that part of the story, then you don't understand the structure of the entire story. So it's really an important triad. Oh, hey, Carol. That, that's that's my thought. I also think it's important for us to go back and talk about blackness at some point, if it's possible. Thank you. Hi, Carol. Do you really quickly want to introduce yourself to our lovely audience? I know. I'm firstly, I'm so sorry. Many apologies. Let me get this light out. I've got this. I was in SOAS today and then I had this kind of like, you know, oh, God, um, uh, children, my own children issues that I had to get home and so sort out. So please uh, do, you know, I'll do many apologies, but um, so yes, yeah, so I, I work at SOAS. I've worked at SOAS before. Is everyone, some people, who's from, show me if you're from SOAS. 
are, are you oh yay right okay um so so i work in the um disability neurodiversity team so i support students with um who are neurodiverse but um uh in my kind of like my other hat like for many years now like Steph, you know i've just been really engaged in working with black students and working with black staff and helping I you know I was kind of like involved in setting helping to set up breaking barriers mentoring scheme and also continue to be involved with working with black staff as well to sort of set up uh, our forums and also with students and as well I do work in our in my local community Labrock Grove where I live so I'm very sorry to be late to the um to the conversation but um yeah whatever I can I'm just going to be so interesting because it's just such what a what a drama what I mean I made story what it was just something else wasn't it it was just like wow what is that you know I just kind of like I actually watched it late so I watched it all like all the episodes back to back like literally over not even like seven days I think I just kind of like I think I watched it all in about three or four days I was just, it was just like, I was like, I've got it next one, you know, it was just brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we were just talking about the depictions of sexuality. And <sighs> um, so I just ask about Terry's threesome and how do, how do we as an audience member feel about finding out um, after the fact that the threesome wasn't as spontaneous and as innocent as Terry initially thought it was um, and it's definitely raised this really good questions question about blackness so now that you've joined um, I would love for us to talk about maybe blackness and sexuality and how both of them are presented on the show um, for example another HBO show obviously Insecure you know the depiction of sexuality um, is very different than I would say in the show and I think a lot of this is to do how very different British you know, forms of sexuality are seen compared to Americans. So, for example, I don't know if you've seen Insecure, but um, in Insecure, East, there's a whole episode arc about a blowjob and how controversial it was for Issa to give this blowjob. Um, and that was quite, at the time, was seen quite like, you know, quite hot and like controversial part to talk about. And, and I just wanted to talk more about how Black people feel about sexuality or seen as like, sexual deviant maybe um and these kind of questions i don't know if that made sense <laughs> so mm. if you have questions do let me know um and i think this time if we could hear from rush that would be great and then carol hisham and then back to stephanie thank i'm so happy jackie thank you um so as a viewer because i'm like hopping i was like so mad i wanted to throw stuff at my television when um do well pretty much like i was like okay she's about to have a, a positive sexual experience with two you know uh white guys i was just like okay this is interesting but then like when you realize that she was just being exploited i was just appalled and there's so much like throughout the show you feel so much uh, secondary embarrassment and, and secondary guilt you know um just be, and you're not able to, uh, you know, it's already behind you. I, I was kind of putting myself also in Terry's shoes. You know, it's already happened. Um, do you decide to just move on and, and, you know, kind of hold that? Or like, can you reject the experience? It wasn't violence, just that confusion, that like kind of weird, sticky, gross gray feeling. Um, I have no else, no other way to express it. But uh, also, I have a question. So, uh, are is it less controversial for Black women to give blowjobs in the UK? Like, I, I think. <laughs> sorry, I didn't phrase that. I, I, I just kind of feel like. <laughs> I I, feel, I think, and I'm speaking obviously from my own experiences. I have found that British people, especially young British people, are a lot more. I don't black for better, more vulgar, more open to talk about sexual experiences. While I found mm -hmm. that black people compared to their white counterparts are a lot more private a lot more likely unlikely to vouch about how many partners they have or who they're dating or who they're seeing it's just something i noticed about how in the uk the way we talk about sexuality is already quite split so it, it was just interesting to see 
black women being openly sexual, pursuing things, going out for things and not being shy about it. I phrased that very terribly. I had too many thoughts running through my brain. So I just want to respond to that part because I loved Insecure too. Um, it's like, I think that with Issa, you know, there's so much like, you know, she's college educated. And then also like all of her friends are like college educated. She's kind of like living that like fairly high off the hog. I mean, I can't afford a place in LA. <laughs> um, I don't know how people do it, but I think that there is a lot of that going on. Whereas, and then, um, whereas like uh, Arabella's group is a little bit more ratchet. Um, you know, it's a, a little bit more down to earth. <laughs> and so I kind of think that you're not gonna have that same conversation. Um, about oral sex or like any type of like sexual act exactly the same way. Carol, what are your thoughts? Oh, <laughs> so right, so where do I come in? It is, um, I suppose, I mean, so much, isn't there? So just sifting through, so as I kind of work my way through all the themes, all the emotions, all the, I think for me, there were a few things. One, it took me back to my own kind of like, you know, sexual experiences in my teens and my teens in my early 20s. And obviously, you know, being the age I am, just thinking back to then and thinking, gosh, how positive is it that we can all, that you can make a mistake like in a sexual experience, right? you can get off with somebody and it's not that great and things don't quite work out. And actually you can actually talk about it and you can actually, you know what I mean? That we can like share this with other young people and other, uh, other people and not have to hide and not to just go, oh God, that was really, you know, either gross or I drunk too much or I didn't, should, I, should, I made the wrong, dis, wrong decision or whatever. I'm not going to talk about it. So for me, there was something about how what she does in this is that she confronts, like for me, for my generation, not splitting off around sexuality because I grew up where sexuality was not discussed within the family. You know what I mean? No one talked to me about sexual experiences. It was just all about get your head down, read your books, then you know what I mean and then you're you know and then there was this thing, nothing uh, you know no no one kind of like sat down and had those kind of conversations at all and so the when you kind of like you know came of age and had sexual experiences it was just like there was no one really to talk about it so everything was just shrouded with you know negativity or guilt or you know to I me mean? and so they were buried so I really really applauded that because yeah Terry she copped off with two guys and then something, and then she realized, oh my God, these guys, they, you know what, they know each other. And then it was just kind of like, so how did she feel about that? But I think what was really powerful is that it was like in Michaela Cole exploring that, it's just kind of like really saying to all of us, you know what, we're going to have some of those kind of experiences, bar the, the whole thing of what happens to um, Arabella. But all of these other kind of experiences where it doesn't work out, it's all messy, and da, da, da. she explores all the kind of like the, the messy areas around, you know. And I just thought that that was really, really great because for us, for black people, for black women, for black people, there's this whole area of guilt, there's this whole area, there's this thing which we don't, where we go, and it's all kind of like mixed in with stuff like, you know like you don't have sex before marriage or you don't have sex period you know I'm talking of periods I love for me I love that thing when Arabella has sex during her period and she's like oh sorry I've got my tampon in let me just take that out and then it's just kind of you know I mean she's so this it was like yeah this kind of stuff is what happens rather than this whole fairy tale of whatever people think is going on in sex. There's a whole lot of fumbling around, falling over, tripping over, can't get the condom off, oh my, you know what I mean? As well as, of course, all the stuff where it's not pleasant and where, you know, like for instance, when the guy, what's his name, the, the guy who, um, he takes the condom off and she doesn't know. I mean, all of those, I mean, she really explores a whole range of things from the bits where, 
it's like, God, you know what I mean? I shouldn't really, you know, you feel a bit bad about that. Two, the two things where they're violence and it's, you know, so I think the whole continuum is there. But Terry's, that specific incident, Jackie, around about Terry and the two guys, for me, I put that in the bracket of, oops. Uh, oopsie. Do you know what I mean? Kind of like, uh oh, oh. Do you know, you know? And it's nothing to feel guilty or thing about, you know what I mean? It's kind of, did you have a good time? Is it, you know what I mean? Or whatever, rather than actually as a kind of, a, yeah, it was good that it was explored. And she goes there in terms of sexuality. I think she, re I think Michaela really, obviously she goes in her depiction of uh, black, um, black uh, men having sex with each other, homosexuality. She just goes there. She wants us to look at it all, doesn't she? She wants to really take up all those bits where we go that we don't do that black people don't do that. that's what white people do that's not you know we don't have sex during our period what what black women don't do that kind of you know we don't have threesomes we don't so she is really exploding kind of like a lot of the myths that i didn't even know i grew up with because they know they weren't talked about but they were there because when i forayed out and had my own experiences, I didn't talk about them. So I knew they were taboo. These were an odd, or they were taboos, certainly in my generation. And so that's why I think I just kind of like couldn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get through that it fast enough. I was like, what's the next? I mean, I loved it all. Her depictions of family, you've talked about it all, but family, oh my gosh, the family, the, it just, yeah, it's just brilliant. So many things. <laughs> Can I respond? I want to respond. Carol, definitely about the period sex. I completely forgot about that part. Um, and then also, one other thing I wanted to add in was that, like, how much more this opens up the conversation about group sex. Like, I don't know what sorts of media y'all are talking, like, watching, but... I know what sorts of media I watch and like it's not there's not a lot of MMF action so to see that in a major uh like just as a matter of course mm. you know that's pretty awesome like holy crap sex on my period that's something I can ask for from my partner like oh oh so it's not just like fun for you during this threesome like you know I'm the center of attention so um yeah that's <laughs> Um, and um, also, um, just on um, talking um, when you're what you're talking about, Carol, of being like um, when it's not spoken about, it almost doesn't exist. Um, and like particularly uh, in um, uh, kind of uh, there are lots of crossovers in terms of mental health as well, um, where um, language is incredibly important. And um, uh, for me anyway, um, diagnosis, um, and for some people it's, you know, it's different, but um, that can be important to nail down um, the language as something that can be world, both world changing and world creating, I guess. Um, and um, she, um, Terry comes back to um, the threesome at the end of the series, um, at the very end and she's kind of like well actually you know I think like something wrong took place there and it's the first time that she talks about it to anyone else in the very last episode um but also again with um kind of zooming out a bit we um also uh, or some of us might not also realize that that what took place there um was um rape because there was no consent and that is and by its definition, again, where language is important, rape by deception, i.e. you mm. go into something thinking one thing and actually, you know, what actually happens is something that you didn't consent to, i.e. would she have consented to it if they knew? Well, we don't know that, but, mm. you know, in that, um, in the in the event, she didn't know. And so she wasn't able to consent to the um, situation. Um, and then um, just going back to um, what you were talking about, about um, blackness and sexuality um, and linking the two um, in a book that I'm reading currently um, called um, In the Wake uh, on Blackness and Being. And Christina Sharpen that talks about um, 
blackness as almost, and I hope this isn't um, a kind of crude analogy, but um, blackness as um, transness, I guess, as a state of um, continual becoming. And I think that's really, um, that really um, kind of struck me um, when we think about blackness in connection to sexuality and where um, the kind of, um, the, the mechanisms um, and structures that sexuality like fits within are, cannot really neatly be applied to um, bodies of color. Um, and so it kind of in this, both in the discussion, i.e. in us talking about our sexual encounters, whether they go, you know, um, whether they're good or bad, or whether you like threesomes or use dating apps and all of these things, um, just that language um, can really be um, both healing and restorative, but also can open up new possibilities for um, Black people when it comes to exploring our sexuality and exploring, um, uh, yeah, exploring our sexuality in a way that um, kind of feels comfortable to us, but also in a way that pushes back on the expectations that people have um, of us and our bodies. Thank you. There's some really, really good points. When you spoke about language, I just really quickly before we go to um, Stephanie, um, Michaela keeps saying this thing that happened. Don't mm. call it a memory. It's a thing. And I and when you said language, I think that is really what she's trying to hit home. How can I call this thing that I don't remember, that I don't recall, which trauma I'm not ready to sit down with? a memory if I don't know when it begins and starts or where I begin and start within that memory. And I just realized that as you were talking, so thank you. Um, and can, Stephanie, please let us know your thoughts as well. Um, yeah, actually, I was really struck by that point. Um, one, of, one of the key things around language that came up for me was, how articulate Arabella is. She's a writer and that monologue. And so it was really key for me when she said rape her and not rape this. So it was like, this is a choice. Like she was intentionally choosing to distinguish between like the thing that a person is and the thing that a person does. And so I was like, when she said that, I was like, oh yeah, mm, I see what you're doing there. Okay, that aside, mm -hmm. um, I wanna bring up something that I don't think we, we haven't talked about this at all, but I come from a Caribbean background and growing up, uh, sexuality is a bit different in the Caribbean. I, I'm not gonna speak like for all Caribbean people, Carol, uh, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I, I my, the way that sexuality is depicted of Caribbean people is really sloppy and messy. It's like Caribbean people, like that's where you go to get sex. Do you know what I mean? So it was really strange for me because I was confused when I was watching it. I was like, Terry acted like a Caribbean person. Like I was reading her as someone, the way that she acted, how loose she was. Her energy was like auntie vibes. Like she's gonna make a great auntie someday. <laughs> like that was how I was reading her. Mm -hmm. She was like that auntie that you go to when you mess up, you're like, yo auntie, this is how I messed up. What do I do? And, <laughs> and then I was talking to, um, uh, like a black British Nigerian British person that I know and she was like no 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 she's definitely Nigerian and I was like what I was really confused by that and, and so then I was watching the show with new eyes um not seeing her as a Caribbean character so without Terry being a Caribbean character there's no representations of Caribbeans really not as a central theme of the distinguished distinguishing blackness in that particular way and especially in London I'll speak to London <laughs> I don't know the whole of the UK I really only live in my little bubble in London I'll say like blackness is really boiled down to African or Caribbean um because there's no such thing as like you know black British ambiguity here, right? Um, <laughs> no matter how long you've been here. Um, and so if, for me, I was looking at the show, looking for depictions of like Caribbean blackness and she didn't really engage with that too, too much. And I thought that was a bit of a missed opportunity um, with the exception of like the various sort of 
background characters that come into uh, Kwame's life, um, uh, the people that he's having sex with, um, and the potential sub characters uh, of the the friends. Oh, I can't remember their names. I'm terrible. Um, there was the mm. light skinned trophy woman, and there was the friend who left. Arabella um, and they sort of represented like tropes of Caribbean sexuality to me like this light-skinned woman she's she's meant to be prudish and she's meant to be a trophy she's not supposed to want sex for herself she's just supposed to be like a light-skinned trophy for this man who's like made it in society like now he's got money he's in the penthouse he's got his light-skinned if not white woman trophy um she has no agency even though she was asking to participate in a threesome and he denied her of that um and then he, he was intentionally preventing her from participating in that and while simultaneously having sex with multiple partners without i mean not without their consent without or with their consent on individual um like individual sexual acts, but without them knowing that he's having sex with multiple partners um, in the same time periods. Um, and so I think that is a pretty average depiction of Caribbean black male sexuality. Um, I don't know if they say or don't say that he is or isn't Caribbean, but I think um, like that is a key element, the way that we could think about Caribbean sexuality compared to the depictions of African sexual, um, African, sexual, African um, characters that are supposed to embody Black respectability politics. You're supposed to go to school, church, mm. home, and that's it. Mm. <laughs> You're not supposed to have friends outside. You're not even supposed to know people like Arabella who are having sex and doing drugs and getting raped. Like that's something that happens to people who don't do that. So she was sort of like living a life that's so separate from what is allowed of uh, of African young women. So I'll pause there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think that very nicely opens up my next question, which is about Kwame trying to meet someone and for lack of a better word, as you said earlier, pass a straight. I wouldn't, I personally didn't feel like Kwame was passing a straight. I thought Kwame was trying to meet someone and explore his sexuality. And you, I mean, just be like, what, what are women like? Do I like women? Do I wanna have a connection with a woman? What would it be like? And I think everyone is allowed to have that. But obviously the show, again, shows it a little bit more complicated. And I would love for us to discuss this initial meet cute between these two people and then what we got to see in the final. Um, and, and your personal feelings as a viewer, I as a viewer was very frustrated. I didn't get it. I was like, why, why is she mad at him? He didn't do anything wrong. He was honest. You were being weird. Um, and just this kind of, and with that, um, I want to talk about her fetishization of the black man and how she felt very much in her right that she could share these fantasies that she has with him but then he wasn't allowed to kind of keep some things for himself and just this conversation that they had afterwards and especially Arabella's reaction also I would love for us to kind of talk about a bit more so um, I think it'd be good maybe to start with Hisham from your perspective and then Rush, Carol, and Stephanie, thank you. Um, I think, um, uh, again, and this is something that the show does really well because you, um, every episode you're given, you're challenged, I guess, mm -hmm. in a really specific way because these kinds of ethical questions really um, get to the core of what we find uncomfortable and difficult as a society, but also as an individual as well. Um, and I return to the asymmetry as well, because, um, or, or rather even when we're looking at um, definitions, and this is something that I only realized when I watched it the second time round, which was that at first I was also very frustrated and I was kind of like, well, he, um, like what you said, Jackie, is using this opportunity to really explore um, his sexuality and all of these um, questions that he has about it. Um, the second time I watched it, I kind of went a step further and said that actually there's something going on here which um, 
uh, number one, for example, I feel like um, honesty is um, uh, honesty is really well. It's very important um, when you're dating, when it comes to um, any kind of relationship, but that's romantic or otherwise. I think honesty and trust um, should be um, is important at the formation, particularly if he's exploring um, something that's imp important to him. And so, what um, I found the second time was actually um, similarly to the case um, where um, with Terry, she um, you know has that experience with the threesome and then realizes afterwards that you know it wasn't completely um what they kind of you know um said it was how is that any different from what Kwame does um on this date technically he did and was not upfront about you know that and clearly that was an issue for her which really really complicates the entire dynamic because then is that also rape by deception or at least that encounter is that encounter mm. more problematic than we kind of want to um, allow ourselves to believe. Um, and then um, Michaela also compl um, Cole complicates that even further by saying that, you know, or well, actually look, here's this white woman who is, um, who is, I mean, I'd go as far as to say racist, but who is, you know, clearly um, fetishizing this black man and his body and all of the ideas and the stereotypes around his body and around his um, agency and his intentions. And she is kind of, I don't feel like, I feel like that kind of offers a counterbalance, a counterweight to um, the other side of it. But also um, I think she also gets off, I kind of, came away and she kind of gets off with actually, you know what, like all of that was fine because um, you liked me about this one thing. Um, and so that's kind of how I felt about it, but um, yeah. So I, uh, I've been out for a really long time. Uh, this scene was really, uh, I've been out since like high school. I identify as a uh, non-binary pansexual or, you know, I just, when I'm on the internet, I guess I just call it a fancy bisexual, call it a day. Um, I felt such complicated feelings about it. And I guess I just wanna start at the top of my thoughts, which was, it's really ridiculous to expect any truth on the internet um, or especially any truth on online dating, um, you know, outside of, you know, being just straight up catfish. Um, I, I think that uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, I don't need to know anybody's sexual number. I just need to know like how many people you've been with since your last sex test, you know, and what the outcome of that is. I think that that's as, as much as you really need to know. Um, and if you're just shopping for some sex organs, as much people, as many people do when they're online dating. Um, I don't think that there needs to be this huge uh, divulging of like past information or like getting into politics because really you're just trying to get in those sheets. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking a lot about Kwame um, when, you know, when I, uh, when I date folks that identify as lesbian um, and how paranoid they are um, about like my sleeping with men in the past. Um, and um, for, I was taking it even a step further to think about like my relationships with white women um, and who's expected to be masculine or feminine um, in a lot of those uh, situations. It's, it's often expected that like I'm a stud, uh, which, you know, is it a thing uh, for me? But uh, it's just like, who gets to be masculine? Who gets to be feminine? Who has control or ownership of my sex parts during the sexual act, you know? Um, and, and what are those expectations? I, I think that uh, what Kwame did, I don't know if it was necessarily wrong unless he wanted to pursue a relationship with this woman. You know, she just wanted some black dick, you know? Like that's, mm -hmm. that's her prerogative. And if they wanted to go through with it, then like you, it's as advertised. Mm -hmm. um, so I just thought that it, she was just, it was just fake outrage, I think. And I, I also think that, you know, Arabella's character was not in a correct state of mind during any of that period. So um, I don't think that it's the equivalent to sexual assault. I think that, you know, the meat and potatoes of the thing and 
I, I think that uh, everybody got what they mostly agreed upon and that the real problem was that she had uh, the fixed problem in her, uh, a fixed issue that like she was sleeping with a straight man, especially when we think about like how many uh, straight men have sex with men, you know? Um, I, I'm gonna stop there. I, this is a very hot topic for me, so. <laughs> Carol? Yeah. Um, so Kwame, so let me just backtrack. Does Kwame sleep with the white woman because he's going through, just to get a bit of content, because he's going through a whole big sort of like a crisis yes. for himself of his sexual identity? I think after the confrontation he has with Arabella in the bar That's, after the party. Yeah. He, ah, the party, yes. He kind of comes to... I think it's a sort of distraction from dealing with the trauma and, and having to face it. And I yeah. think as we kind of said before, it's it's the way both are very, very differently dealing with the situation. Mm. We find so solace in, in the apps and maybe kind of choosing a different approach, right? Maybe there's something else out there. Maybe if I date women or not, yeah. Coming out, like maybe I would get a different outcome this time. I think that's yeah. because we can see that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I kind of like felt that, you know, you know, Michaela, she is just really uh, exploring just every single angle of the prism, isn't she? She wants to come in and look at what about this? What about, this? you know, what do we feel about this? What do we. I, and I felt that, yes, I think there is, like um, Rush was saying, there is something about that issue of consent. Even within that, there is this whole thing about consent. If, if I don't know everything, if I don't know enough, then am I in a situation to be able to give the consent? She's kind of like, so there is that aspect. But very much as you say there, Rush, at the end of the day, you know, if this is what, you signed up to do you know what I mean you're going for it's kind of like you know the meat and the potato this is it and then afterwards you're acting all outraged oh my god but you but it's like well you didn't have any comfort you you didn't have any conversations you didn't get to know the person you weren't interested in this person you was just it was sex that's okay that's what it was but don't backtrack and go but you actually lied to me no because you didn't really are, you know, no one took the time to really kind of, that's why I think for me with Terry, there's no outrage because it's at the end of the day, listen, this is just kind of the stuff that can happen. Do you know what I mean? When you don't, you know what I mean? When you're sort of like led by, you know, desire, it's desire, you desired, you know, and of course the fetishization and all the things that we're imposing our own thing on something, we've got to take responsibility for that. Surely that's a, in that moment, you know. So I kind of like felt that, um, yeah. So I think she's looking at, you know, so that those issues about was it honest? Was it dishonest? It's all very complicated. I don't think there's any kind of like, I'm sure for Kwame, uh, there's a parts where he felt, yes. There is, of course, we're grappling, we're human beings, we're grappling with all of those issues of, Am I being honest? Am I being true to myself? What does it mean to be true to myself? What does it mean to be true to, you know, and it's all tinged with, of course, and he felt some regret and he felt, you know, that sorry that he'd let himself down as well as, you know what I mean? So there was, everything is, is, is all in there. It's all tied in. So, yeah. So, yeah, it's very, very, Com it's very it is it's all about that it's very very complicated but I think it was also about Michaela exploring that you know brought again the issue of consent and what that what does that mean <laughs> all right yeah I mean I don't think I have much to add to this I, I agree with the general consensus which is that Michaela Cole did a lot of research for this show and she put the idea of sexual consent on a spectrum mm. and she examined 
a storyline that would allow her to show just about every kind of sexual content that I could think of, yeah. including the very, very gray area of this situation with Kwame. And I found myself in this position when I was thinking about it. And I was like, ooh, yeah, it is sort of a lie by omission kind of thing. Mm. Mm. But she was really just trying to get some plastic. She didn't care about just, him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she made the situation so messy, right, Russia? It was super messy. And at the end of the day, I was just sitting in that mess. Like, yeah, it's all pretty messy like that. <laughs> It's pretty messy, but I think what she did one time. Do you know when she calls out the um, the editor guy? Um, I forget his name. Oh, she yeah. calls him out on that stage. But wow. what she did there, I thought was really interesting. Where she goes, sort of a legal analysis with it. She's like, in the UK, it's definitely rape, and in Australia, it's a little bit rapey. In the US, it's not rape at all. And I was just mm. like, think about that. Po the politics of location that she did there. She was like, even the law is messy when it comes to this. Um, and I thought that that the whole thing with Kwame and the white woman, at first I was thinking, oh yeah, sort of like what I heard from Carol, that she, he was running away from a really difficult thing that challenged his core. So something that looks like the complete opposite, right? A, a white woman, <laughs> Um, as opposed to, like, m like I'm pretty sure all of his sexual partners were black men. Pretty sure. I don't remember seeing white men. Um, and mm. so he went away from black men, which is obviously with, when we're talking about the fetishizing of black male bodies. He went away from that stereotype and went to the white woman. And so... I was really confused by it at first and I was thinking, but he gets so much love from black women in his life and he gets so much validation from black women in his life. So if he was really exploring his sexuality, wouldn't he go find another black woman to love? I was confused by that. And so I thought it was such an intentional choice that she chose a white woman or rather that Kwame chose a white woman to explore his sexuality with. Um, and. In that way, I sort of deprived that white woman of her own agency. I was confused by it. Mm. I still don't think I know very much. I, I haven't come to any sort of conclusion about how I feel about that situation. And I think that was intentional too, because it's too messy. Mm. <laughs> like it's just too messy. Oh. And Michaela, she doesn't explore her sexuality with black men, does she? Or does she at all? I don't think she does or if she does have because she's heterosexual but she doesn't explore that as i remember there's no black men in it it's all you know white men um asian men middle eastern men so there's something for me around michaela and how she connects with um as well with her own blackness and also with caribbeanness as well not her own caribbean but caribbean people so i think aside from that i was I had questions, uh, not questions, I was kind of intrigued by those. Things. So I think I I want to go back to what Stephanie said about, uh, you know, Michaela choosing this white woman for Kwame. Um, so I, and what I was thinking, my like my thought process behind it was just like, okay, so Kwame has been uh, traumatized. He's had his agency taken away from him and maybe he feels less like a man. Um, he's been helpless to stop the uh, actual assault. He's been hampered from seeking justice for that assault. Uh, his friends have kind of just sort of like made light of it um, because Arabella is still focusing on her healing. I don't think that Terry was as supportive as she could have been uh, to Kwame during those times. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe his choice or the, his character's decision uh, to go with this white woman is about not feeling threatened, not feeling confronted, not feeling um, challenged. You know, she's uh, that, that like feminine archetype, like this white woman that's not going to like harm anybody. Um, and so I'm thinking I could be totally bullshitting here, but um, maybe that's where he's coming from or that's what she's trying to discuss or that's what he's trying to like move through. 
I, I definitely agree with that. I think, yeah, it's definitely a choice that was made on purpose to have that conversation that the, they do end up having, because I think that's an important aspect of that encounter. Not only is he fetishized as a black man, something that might not have happened to him before when he was only seeking out other black men. So I think that was also part of kind of making him realize that position that he suddenly has put himself in isn't just like this experience that he's having, but also this racialization that will come with that experience, which he fortunately, because he was surrounded by black people, he might have forgotten about in a, in a weird twisted way. I don't know if that makes sense. Almost this like realization of, oh, you see me as this black man rather than this person, Kwame, who I am. So um, definitely agree. Um, I think it's time for us to move on to the last theme, the theme of trauma. Um, I want to start off um, the theme of trauma with a question we got. Um, do you think that victims of sexual violence can find solace in the ending of the show? While it acts out a revenge fantasy, it was also ambiguous. So I would love to hear your thoughts of how you felt it was good, oh, sorry. And if you felt it was good, a good ending to the series, and it's exploration of different experiences of trauma and violence. And um, Carol, would you like to start off? Gosh, they, oh. Can I come in on that, Alters? I need to, yeah, because the when it, how it ended, I was a bit like, oh, you know, maybe because I just didn't want it to end or <laughs> whatever, but. Yeah, I think I'll come in and hear, yeah, I just want to gather my thoughts on that, yeah. Stephanie? Um, I like to think of myself as a storyteller too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was particularly struck by it, um, by the ending. I found it really satisfying because it is about grappling with trauma and violence and there's no definitive end to it do you know mm. what I mean it is about sort of sifting through the choices you can make and and how to move forward and so I found the ending really great because I thought she she could have found this guy if she couldn't find him she would have found him and committed an act of violence and lose a bit of herself mm. and she thought about like hiding it hiding it putting it under the bed taking everything apart and ripping it up and hiding it and not showing it to anyone or bringing him back and then feeling like she's in control of that sexual um the sexual um experience she thought about all the different options all the different ways it could have played out and she laid it out and I found that she, as she was learning about the structure of how to write, um, and then she applied that to her um, process for, for healing herself, that I couldn't think of a more perfect ending than, than that, just thinking through and seeing all the different ways it could have played out and seeing her alive at the end, having, learned all the lessons she's learned and then packaging it into this show and helping all of us talk about it in this way. Yeah. Stephanie, I just want to say that, uh, yeah, I think you put a great, like, yeah, exactly. Same, same, ditto. Uh, I thought it was incredibly cathartic. Um, everything I'm going to say is totally just echoing you, so. Oh, she's such a storyteller, isn't she? Stephanie, you just does perfect. And you um, helped to stimulate, I suppose, something which is really about how do we move on from trauma? I mean, thinking for us as Black people and thinking about trauma, um, sexual trauma, racialized trauma, and about how trauma, if it's not looked at if we don't unearth it like you say dig it out from like you know she's going to pull it from out underneath the bed is she going to you know this thing 
that she, she dismembers. How do you bring it back so you have memory? So there's something about, and I connect very much to this, about how, as a people, what we've done with our traumas, how, you know, I mean, they lay buried in our subconscious, buried in the past, buried, you know, ancestrally, historically, but that actually we have to bring them forward in order to remember. We need to remember in order to move forward because if we don't, we are frozen and we are kind of stuck. So, um, and then that's something that, yeah, that's just definitely something I think a lot about in terms of like post-traumatic slave syndrome, in terms of thinking about, you know, um, what we have um, faced in our, you know, um, ancestrally. Um, and I think Michaela Cole, if, although she, she takes, you know, it's a specific issue, she's looking at rape and consent, but really what's, in, what's buried in that and what's unnerved is a huge big, you know, thing for us as a people about about exactly about that issue of trauma and how and how do we digest it how do we handle it how do we think about it how do we then talk about it and as you said stephanie brilliant and rush you know here we are talking about it and at all once one brings something from the subconscious into the conscious then the healing starts i think that's like tony morrison says that doesn't she 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 talks about that that memory the whole thing of you know this was the oh what was the amazing oh the amazing novel she wrote about the ghost that comes back the ghost of the slave uh, Gina Bell, beloved beloved. Yeah. beloved yeah beloved you know and that is that is it this is it we need to bring and you know all of the mess you know this is what we've covered the messiness the kind of like you know the things which don't add up you know, for us as black people to be messy, to allow our, us to explore the messiness without it, the, you know, the politics of respectability that weigh on us, where we can't talk about that, or we, you know, that's not what we do. That's, you know, are we wrong or are we right? But hey, you know, I mean, certainly I think that was so freeing in terms of the trauma about being able to say, you know, yeah, we, you know, we have this mess in our life and we can heal and we can grow and we can become like she became freed up to write. You know, that was that, that was the freeing up. She could, her creativity was linked into that trauma. Then she, her creativity was blossomed from there. So I think there's a really much like wider kind of um, implications for us as a people and trauma and what Michaela Cole, how she expresses that, how she brings that through. I just want to jump in there um, because um, what you said, Carol, kind of reminded me again of um, this book that I'm reading, which I'm literally just obsessed with. So What's it called? <laughs> um, so it's called um, In the Wake on Blackness and Being by okay. Christina Sharp. Oh, I'll write um, that down. And just thinking about the ending and the very last episode of um, I May Destroy You, I think that um, the kind of, uh, she talks about, um, so in the book she talks about, you know, how can we memorialize um, something that is still ongoing, something that's present, um, which is the afterlives of slavery, right? And um, the whole book is about how mm. we're living in the wake of um, mm. slaveship kind of um and so yeah how do we memorialize something that's ongoing and translating that into um into this series where we're talking about how do we find closure on something that's not yet closed and um, which speaks to our traumas which um haven't been resolved and uh, you know we're mm. working through and so the open-endedness of the ending um having the multiple scenarios of you know where she gets revenge and then um the very final ones where she gets kind of closure and then you know they have that incredible scene where they're having sex and whatever and they wake up in the uh, morning and she's like can you leave now and that's kind of her expelling him from um, uh, from that um, space of, of trauma. So we've got kind of like all of these different um, um, imaginings, I guess, of the ending. Um, so linking that back to the significance for survivors, um, 
particularly from a mental health point of view, we've got an ending um, and a general narrative anyway that's open-ended, it's not static. There are highs and lows and she goes through different periods of, you know, um, be, uh, what we see her being kind of relatively fine, whatever that means, um, mm -hmm. and having these dips and, and, and whatever. And so um, I, I thought that was really great about the ending as well. Um, and also um, another reason why I thought it has some significance there as well is um, she deals with um, the perpetrators, the rape, uh, she says, um, and the kind of, once you get into that and that kind of area of, um, you know, what would I say or what would I do or, and you're imagining all of these different scenarios, that is messier than, you know, everything that comes before and in a wider discussion anyway. Um, and um, perhaps even represents a bigger taboo um, than any other question that kind of surrounds um, rape or sexual assault in general. Um, so having those different um, uh, kind of, um, those different scenes where she imagines different outcomes as well, mm. I feel like is also um, uh, kind of um, incredible and almost positive um, ending in saying that, um, kind of echoing what she says throughout the whole series, which is there is no one way for you to um, manage your grief. There's no one way for you to deal with and sort through it. And um, and I think um, that's mm. really hammered home right at the end with those um, different things, particularly um, with dealing with um, her raper as well. Thank you for that. I am, I'm just looking at a time. So while I think there's a lot more to say about trauma in depth, I think it'd be good for us to look at some questions now. Um, so one of the questions we have um, is about the conversation about veganism and in which way um, Arabella becomes the face of this hip, you know, uh, hackety based <laughs> vegan <laughs> food shop. And, um, sorry, um, and kind of this idea of like her friend is getting a cut for bringing in black people to be the face of a something that is seen as historically white because they want to get money from the black people. How how do you feel that was kind of shown and dealt with? And I think what I what I thought was interesting in a way that what happened at school between Terry, Theo, and Arabella is kind of forgiven because Theo has now done this thing to Arabella. Does that make sense? Like they both kind of did each other dirty and now they're kind of even. I felt like that's a little bit how that was resolved, but if you did feel that differently, do let me know. I mean, I don't think that uh, she did Arabella di dirty at all. If anything, Arabella like, you know, revealed what sort of crap and like kept her friend's future from being trashed. So I don't think that there's any sort of like uh, resolution there other than that, you know, her old coworker and schoolmate is, is trash. Um, <laughs> that's, that's my, that was my take. And, um, you know, I, I think that we've been talking about exploitation in a number of forms, you know, so I, I just think that uh, this whole, um, you know, the exploitation of like, like that happens in social media and, and like representation and then also, um, the idea that uh, one of the things that makes me so upset about like like militant vegans, I guess, is that um, they're not really confronting the violence that happens in the food system, just in general, that there are black bodies, black and brown bodies that are harvesting the food. Um, and so like, what is the idea to like, what is the, what is it to like have a, a cruelty free diet? Um, and then uh, having that that same sort of uh, this this lie like repackaged and sold to folks, um, to black people. Um, I don't know, I felt kind of sticky about it and I don't want to go on a tangent, but yeah. Anyone else have any more thoughts on veganism and blackness? I do have a thought. It's about decolonizing. So the theme of this like series of virtual events this week 
is decolonizing and universities, especially in the UK, <laughs> but especially so us, um, use decolonizing as a, as a buzzword. Um, and I really, when I was watching that scene, I thought of, I thought of this, this buzzword. It wasn't really about bringing in Black people to talk about the food systems and all the violence that exists in there. In fact, they didn't let her talk at all. She was a puppet. They wrote the script for her and they owned her. They exploited the fact that she was in a moment of financial need and they mm. could tell and they exploited that and they used her image and her voice to say something that didn't have anything to do with her. And if they had actually sat down with her and had a conversation about food, about the system, maybe they could have collaborated on a way that would have actually gotten Black people to the table authentically, as opposed to what they did, <laughs> which, which was puppetry and it was disgusting. And I, I relate that back to the discussions on decolonizing because oftentimes what ends up happening is, <laughs> decolonizing is a is a sort of tokenism that they that people in power um, will choose black and brown people to rep like individual black and brown people to represent all black and brown people but they choose those people and they sort of mold those people and they're not actually representing the interests or the goals the future that black and brown people want for themselves and that's the element of the conversation that hasn't really been had and not mm. giving black and brown people the power and space to like meaningfully contribute to decolonizing the deconstruction of this current colonizing that's still taking place that's how i interpreted that situation yeah and leading on from what you're saying stephanie i think i think what Michaela is doing there. I think she's also sounding a bit of a warning for all of us, for black people that are in situations where we can become the kind of like the token voice of, right? And not allowing ourselves to be used. Yeah. And finding yourself, because I think that what, Mika if, if I remember correctly, and I will need to go back and I remember sort of like, and whether or not Michaela is going to, she's going through her trauma. And she's quite split off. So she's quite disconnected. Her, her heart and her, her emotions and her thoughts are quite sort of like, you know, she's just quite flattened. And so she's literally like allowing herself to be used. So there's a consent. It's also a bit of an area of consent there. But how do we allow ourselves? Do we Are we thinking like being really present and really thinking about, hang on a second here. I'm being used to it because as you said, she's suddenly in something and she just kind of goes along with it and she plays along with it, you know, to me. And it's like, and I was watching that thinking exactly as you were saying now about with this decolonizing, that how are we, when we're in these institutions, are we just kind of like become the face of, oh, diversity. We've got a diverse board here. We've got a diverse teaching. We've got a diverse, because we've got one black person one brown person do it you know and so therefore it's a kind of like a warning that of not to be split off it's like about consciousness how conscious are we because I remember Kate she just there were moments when she would just literally just be a kind of you know especially around the um the social media stuff it's like do the smile and uh oh yes yeah, sign the autograph and just do that you know how we can be in this system you know, because you just become used, it becomes a token, it becomes, you know, we're not really engaging ourselves. And I think there was something for me about that split offness, you know, how are we um, um, being co-opted and how far are we allowing ourselves to be co-opted without being really mindful of the consequences of that? I think there was something around that for me. I want to just add very quickly, I know that we've kind of digressed from um, the veganism debate. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, um, no, I think it's um, just to add on to um, uh, what you and Stephanie have been saying, um, and going back to the consent workshops, which, you know, I received training to deliver and um, uh, delivered um, at the beginning of last academic year for incoming freshers. 
And um, also thinking about, um, I think it is a really interesting point around consent and the way that you are used by certain institutions and bodies without mm. fully understanding the implications of um, what mm. the energy and the effort that you're putting in. Mm -hmm. Um, with the consent workshop, um, I know Stephanie, you said you had issues with it, um, as did I. <laughs> um, there are many issues with um, the workshop. Um, one of the biggest issues for me was the fact that they, you try to squish this whole um, discussion around intersectionality onto one slide and the debate is not nuanced. Um, and you basically go over some key terms really to bring everyone up to date. Um, and on that as well, when you're in a team where you're delivering training to people and you're talking about intersectionality and how gender and sexuality and all of these um, different categories um, kind of shift around and morph around depending on um, uh, who you are as well. I found that um, in the largest training groups, the very few pe black people delivering the training are kind of like, okay, so we need to make sure that no two black people can be in the same group because that's a, a waste of, you know, one black person that could do that oh. section. And um, also just thinking about, uh, I mean, again, I think it's important to criticize the institutions you're a part of as well. Um, and thinking about, um, you know, it's Black History Month at the moment, and as soon as it comes around to Black History Month, I know I was approached um, to um, do something based on Black History Day by SOAS, um, and uh -huh. then we to write a blog this time around and all of these things. And this time around, I kind of just sat down and was like, actually, I've got a lot on right now. And yes, it would be an incredible opportunity, but um, it's kind of, you know, unlike this discussion, which is happening between um, all of us are um, people of color, black people here, which is so refreshing and energizing. Um, but in some other contexts as well, you um, have to just peel it back and be like, actually, you know, I'm giving away free labor, free energy. Um, and um, I'm, yeah, so just being aware, going back to your point of um, when you um, might be being exploited in some tiny way and you're not aware of the full implications. Mm. Thank you. Mm. I think Absolutely. we have time for one more question. <laughs> if we really push it through, but if you want to mention it. So um, someone asked, what do we think about the role of the publisher and then the way Arabella mm. in the, of the publisher. I just thought that as we are talking about institution, who's exploiting you, who are we giving consent to? Just as a final thought, mm. how do we feel about the relationship that Arabella does have with their publisher? Like even this idea where she's like, my book is about rape now. And they're like, great, but you have a deadline. And it's like this idea that like you're, even though something traumatic has happened and they've acknowledged it, they're paying for you to go to therapy. However, January 20 to 22nd, we need that book. It's it's a very interesting relationship that's being shown to us. If I could get any mm. reactions, please, thank you. She's really not likable, that woman, is she, at all? This is the one with all the plants, yeah? Oh, gosh. It's just, again, you know, like what, for me, it's kind of like, okay, this is what can happen, the end result of co-option. This is what you become. You become kind of like the literal living, kind of like, you know, real, like you have that, it's just, oh. Yeah, you know, you've lost, like for me, it's like, she really is lost. She's really, really lost herself. For me, it's just kind of like the epitome of like, so that does that, is that what happens when you go up in these institutions? Is this what happens? This is the kind of like the thing that you have to be aware of when you kind of like go up or get power or get status or get, you know, within these mainstream organizations, you can really lose yourself, you know? And um, yeah, it was, so that again, is a kind of like an issue that she explores in that. And of course it is, I mean, for me, how I connect with that is that, you know, I've always been, you know, a person, I really, I do struggle within systems in terms of kind of like, you know what I mean? Would you kind of going up the greasy pole, 
right? And in terms of kind of like losing my feet on the ground and losing my connections with my community and losing my grassroots connections. This, this is the thing really that speaks quite big for me. And it was only from when I, through the work I did with Breaking Barriers, and it was only when I realized that I was trying to encourage young people, young black people to take on positions of, to go, you know, to have the confidence to, you know, go for those positions. Then I was like, but I'm not doing it myself. I'm not doing it. I'm saying, yeah, you can do it. Yeah, you're great, you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, because we've got such brilliance, you know, but I actually am not gonna do it. And then I had to take, I had to look at myself and go, Carol, you can't do that. You actually have to take on a position because you have to be a role model. You know, you have to become a role model so that you are, you, it's not like do as I say, but don't do as I do, right? I have to do, it. and it was with that, then I kind of like, you know, only one couple of steps I just took on. Um, I went for a kind of like a role which was coordinating, you know, the team in order to um, to be a, a role model. But I was always extremely very, very conscious of how when you're sitting in boardrooms with a lot of uh, a lot of white people and where you the co-option is something I particularly have a kind of like a dreaded, I'll be honest, a fear of, of, of losing that. I never ever want to lose that. But it's, again, it's complicated. And I don't know, I have no answers for that at all. But Michaela is right. She And I think she that woman embodies that. A sort of brittle sort of, you know, pretense. And you know what I mean? Just, oh, yeah. <laughs> I totally am picking up what you're putting down, Carol. Um, I, I mean, for real, I, I think oh. about how like, um, well, first off, I am totally a 90s kid. So to see that character, I was I watched the craft like way too many times as a teenager. Um, so that was great. But then I was also thinking about like how, uh, you know, how professionalism is a tool of white supremacy. You know, they literally mm. published her rapist's book how many women were in uh, in the room that uh, mm. could have made a decision that knew about the the pen name, the deception? You know, like how many people um, could have said no, could have shelved it, could have like blown up this guy's spot, but instead they saw the dollar, they saw the money that could be made, they saw Michaela imploding. I mean, um, Arabella imploding, and they made that decision very consciously. There was so much thought in it, and it was just a uh, it was really disgusting. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's how I felt about the publisher's character. <laughs> Thank you. Sadly, this is all the time we have today. Um, this was recorded. So if you like to rewatch it, hear everyone's amazing thoughts, again, this will be available on the YouTube channel to show us for the Festival of Ideas. And next up, we have Britain's 1802 Man of the Year was Haiti's Toussaint Louverotto, I did not say that right, I'm so sorry, to all my Haitian people, I mean Stephanie specifically, um, a mix of folk tales and a panel discussion. Thank you so much for coming and bye. Thank you for having me, thanks everybody. <laughs>